The following podcast may be explicit. One Joe Young presents Adventures from the Shed, a tabletop RPG podcast. You can find us online at adventuresfromtheshed.com. Well, hey, we're here at what is hopefully the launch of Adventures from the Shed 2.0, the online version. Uh, upgraded, maybe we'll patch it as we go to make sure it doesn't have any flaws in it. Um, I am on with, state your name, please. Eli. Eli. Eliezer. Eli. Say, say your first name, the full pronunciation. Eliasar Alejandro Gonzalez. That's awesome. All right. So um, you're what? Swedish? Man, <laughs> yeah. I wish. I'd be tall. <laughs> nope. Exactly. Just a well, little Hispanic boy from screen. Texas. And um, I'm Joe, back again. Uh, we, what we're going to do, what we're starting today is finding a way to show people how to create a group. We've got a lot of questions all over the interwebs as well as individually. Almost anyone who's played for any given amount of time has heard somebody else say, how do I get in a group or how can I start a group? And nowadays we have the internet. And um, at the current time, as we're recording this, we are on uh, a, a whole lot of people in the world are on some kind of quarantine due to the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, it's, it's a strange time we're living in, for sure. Uh, some of us have the luxury of working from home. Others don't. There's a lot of changes going on in the world. And I want to play games again. So I have started reaching out to people. And we're going to try and document our, our journey into starting a new group playing a role-playing game. Uh, I, I'm still, in my head, I want to say tabletop role-playing game. I don't know if anybody will actually be at a table, but that's the, that's the nomenclature we've always used for it. We plan on starting up with a Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition event adventure because it is the world's most popular role-playing game. We'll do that. Uh, we'll venture into any other systems we want as we go as well. So, um... Eli, let me ask you a, a couple of questions. This is all part of making sure you're a good fit for our, our online group. Um, this is something that I would encourage anyone to go through, players, game masters, whomever. Make sure you talk to people before the first session so you have an idea of what's going on. Um, what, uh, what is your... Uh, favorite game system, or what? What is your history around playing RPGs, and, and what ones have been your the the best for you? All right. Well, to answer the first part of that question, just straightforward Dungeons and Dragons three point five. That's what I started with. That's what I was raised on, literally. <laughs> um, I've been playing tabletop role playing games for the last ten years. The first five or six was just D and D three point five. Uh, my junior year of high school, I started moving into uh, White Wolf products, Vampire the Masquerade, Mage of the Ascension. Uh, after I graduated, I started experimenting with custom-made systems. Uh, it tweaked a Fallout percentile die-based game. Uh, I always like percentile-based stuff, but it's not as common as I think it should be. Yeah, there are some complicated parts yeah. of the games that a lot of people don't want to get into, which I understand. Well, I just it, think in general, mathematically, a lot of people can wrap their heads around, I've got a 50% chance of doing this. Yeah. But we're ingrained now to know I need to roll an 11 to 20. Yep. <laughs> I mean, it's the same thing, but I've always felt like a, a beginning player would be uh, easier to wrap their heads around the math of a percentile system, but it, it upsets all of the uh, people who've been playing for 11 years plus, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the biggest issue that I found with percentile systems is all of the modifiers that go into some of your roles. Mm. Uh, for example, the Fallout one, just firing a shot at the bad guy, you could have six different things impacting your role uh, yeah. at least. So it's yeah. Um, most recently, I've started looking into the Exalted series from Onyx Path. Okay. Uh, I. That's about the extent of my experience. It's mm -hmm. it, it's been, it's been a fun journey, and I can't wait to see what stories I 
we'll be telling in the future, or I'll be participating in in the future. Cool. When you say that um, the Dungeons and Dragons three five is your favorite, how would you compare that to what you know about Fifth Edition? Um, comparing three three five to Fifth, yeah, it's complicated, <laughs> and I, I mean that in the most literal way possible. You mean There's, three five is complicated, or the yes. comparison? Okay, all right. Yeah, uh, three five is much more complicated than Fifth. Fifth was very much designed to be streamlined and get as many people into the game as possible in as friendly a way as possible. And I love the direction they've taken, but I like my math. I like my, I like my rule crunch. A little so. bit of number porn is okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's one thing that I don't miss is having to choose different feats and all the different changes that you had to go through at certain levels. And uh, when you mentioned the modifiers in that percentile system, I thought of modifiers in 3.5. I mean, and, and earlier, I played the earlier ones. Um, the only three series books I ever had was I owned the 3.0 um, Player's Handbook and Dungeon Master Guide, but I never actually owned any 3.5. At that point, I kind of went right to 4, which I'm in the minority in that I liked 4. It, it had a lot of tactical stuff, but you didn't have to play it. It was uh, just one of those things where if you chose to use a map, it made a lot of difference compared to if you mm -hmm. didn't choose to use a map. And anyway, I like that stuff. I, I can um, understand that. I didn't have much exposure to fourth edition. I did manage to find the uh, keep on the shadow spell module at mm -hmm. a Goodwill. I uh, cool. looked through the, the actual module booklet, the, mm -hmm. all the stats and stuff, and it's a very fun looking adventure. I have no interest in the system, so I kind of tossed those, just the sheets though, because I can reprint yeah. them. I've kept the maps, kept the booklet, even the fancy little folder. That's very cool. Regardless of edition, these adventures are always going to be fun. Yes. As long as you can find a way to adapt the content to what dice you need to roll this time, then, mm -hmm. yeah. Especially a well-written adventure, it goes a long way. Um, and, and now, along that lines, what, um, regardless of the system, what would you say was your favorite uh, campaign or even just an individual scenario? Um, oh, oh my... <laughs> yeah uh -huh. so I have two that I want to bring up first is all the time you need <laughs> campaign yeah um, when I started playing Dungeons and Dragons I kind of did it on accident <laughs> so my my aunt was running a game and okay. she invited me and my brothers to join because we were young kids and uh, her brother my stepfather had just married my mother. So what better way to bond with the kids than to get everybody and some of the family playing a game together. Mm -hmm. We had a session or two and it was, it was very fun, but my brain started immediately working on, okay, I wonder what I could do with it. Yeah. And that turned into uh, creating a little mock scenario yeah. of like a, a drug bust and running my stepfather through it. No, sorry, running my uncle through it mm -hmm. with a character that he had made. A, a, a cleric of St. Cuthbert, a oh. enforcer of the law. Of course. My stepfather came home from work that day when we started it. It was just supposed to be a mock fight, mind you. So he comes in, what are you doing? Oh, we're just running a little mock fight. All right, can I join? Sure. He makes a rogue real quick, and we get into it. It... The fight itself lasts for about an hour or two, and then we spend the next six hours role-playing. Nice. Um, nice. The campaign that came off of that scenario has been, and still is, my, my baby. That game itself ran for six years. I uh, unfortunately had to put it down as several of the players moved away. Yeah. Uh, and uh, online gaming just wasn't as structured and easily available as it is now. Oh gosh! So yeah. that had to go by the wayside. That was when I started picking up Mage, Vampire, uh, mm -hmm. some short one shots. Now you said your aunt. I, I'm I'm curious how many people could say that they were introduced to role playing games by their aunt. 
That's pretty cool. I'm not certain, actually. Well, yeah. I know of at least four. Yeah, those are my siblings. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, uh, that's funny. But um, that that I mean that in itself, that's a cool story. Do you have like a name or an overarching theme for your campaign that you still have your your live world? Um, I don't. I don't have a name for like the the campaign, but I do have the the main country, and we all just kind of refer to it from that it's aru lane okay. it's uh anybody who's familiar with the rangers apprentice book series will know immediately that okay. it's it's just aru and with two letters switched around <laughs> yeah but i, I love that familiar book growing with it. up <laughs> I, i've heard that but I'm, i've heard of the series but i'm not familiar with it so that so when you when you go to play it that's your reference you're going to play are you then yep aru uh, yep, we uh had to reboot it once yeah. so it's still the same world space same npcs some minor tweaks to the story. They haven't gotten to all the major plot points they had before, but honestly, I don't know if they even remember them. <laughs> I can do what I want with it. Yeah, exactly. That, that's a really good point, too. I like that. The, um, the other thing I want to ask you, out of the different systems you played, I know you mentioned the Fallout, you mentioned the Vampire, the White Wolf stuff, Dungeons & Dragons. What is your favorite, um, or where do you feel most comfortable as far as a genre? Is it the post-apocalyptic, roguelike, just medieval fantasy? Where do you, where do you fit best? Uh, as far as most comfortable, I'm, yeah. I'm most comfortable in the, the sword and sorcery type games presented like from Dungeons and Dragons, mm -hmm. um, the, the Baldur's Gate, it, the, that type of fantasy. As to what I fit best in, I found the... I don't want to say grimdark because that comes with some not so nice connotations, yeah. but the more gritty, realistic feel of the White Wolf World of Darkness yeah. setting, it it fits my DM style a bit more, and I can I can evoke so many more emotions from my players, and that's my yeah. biggest thing about being a DM. I don't want to just play a game. I want you to feel something. I want you to leave the table a different person than when you came in. That's, that's very cool to hear. Um, now, how do you feel about that same thing from the player side? What's your contribution as a player to help everyone else at the table get in the feel of it? Well, what do you think you can do to, or what do you do to help with that? As a player, it's... So, I don't have very many opportunities to play as I am the primary DM of my group, in the instances where we do have somebody else running it, I tend to be more of a quote-unquote side character uh, to really let other people take the stage. It's more in line with the habits I formed as a DM, letting the players talk and discuss their ideas, where I occasionally pop in, oh, well, how about this? Or don't forget mm -hmm. that. Yeah, so if the players are all talking about how they're going to go ask this guy to help them, you have to remind them that he's the one that just killed one of their friends, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> because they may have forgotten in the meantime, uh, last yep. session or the session before, right? Um, that, that, um, that plays into another question I wanted to ask you about a single game session. What would it be when you played a side character or running a game as a DM? What, what would you pick out as your single favorite game session that you've ever participated in? Single favorite game session? And you said as a yeah. player or a DM? Yeah, however, whatever made you, wow, that's the one I remember. Do you remember that Saturday five years ago? That kind of thing. So, uh, oof. It's there tough. was one that was very, very impressive and very important to my group. I was a... DM for my main D and D game, uh, some shenanigans involving an ancient relic and stealing it from some sort of thieves guild. It ended up with a very emotional funeral. <laughs> mm. Okay. However, I wouldn't say that that was my favorite single session. My favorite. Do you think it was impactful for your table, though? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Half my group was crying. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, I'd say that's cool in the nicest way. <laughs> of course. I mean, everybody, everybody knows cry it. today. 
<laughs> Everybody yeah. knows it's a safe space there at my table. So cool. it, it's, it, it was nice to see that they were all comfortable enough for that. However, my absolute favorite session would have had to have been when I was running a Mage the Ascension game. I was the storyteller. Um, the party had just confronted a person who would become the big bad of the campaign, or the Chronicle. Unfortunately, in the process, one of their allies ended up sacrificing himself to save a party member who was being held immobile by the big bad. Okay. He, uh, the woman was being charged by a werewolf, so he ran forward and Full Metal Alchemist style turned the floor into a silver spear and stabbed the werewolf. Wow. Yep. Unfortunately, with the paradox system in Mage Ascension, he ended up getting a major backlash. And I do want to put a little special note here. We ran with a, a table rule where anytime you incurred paradox, you would move a block on the Jenga tower. Oh. The tower. the tower was fairly unstable already, so it comes to his turn. I ask him, Johnny, what do you want to do? Mm. He looks at me, gets up, reaches over, and just backhands the tower, <laughs> looks me dead in the eyes, and says, what happens? <laughs> I'm like, you know what? I, I'm giving him full props for this. That werewolf's going down. Jenga! <laughs> so, cool. um, he, he's turned into a silver statue, and everybody is stunned. The first person to get their wits about them uh, decides, wait a second, the bad guy is still there, so he takes a pot shot at him, grazes him in the arm, ba bad guy summons up magic wall of fire to make his escape, the other werewolf is killed, and the building is now on fire. Nice. So everybody's saying, get out of here, get out of here, come on, go, go, go. And my stepfather's character, who was designed purely to literally box werewolves, said, no, I'm not leaving him behind. Buzz is going to want to see his, his body. What? You can't just... And he proceeds to move forward, enhance his strength magically, and pull this at least two-ton silver statue out of the marble floor and take it to the truck. Nice. They get back to their little safe house, and they call Buzz <laughs> on the way, which my, my aunt actually had given a very, very beautiful performance of a tear-filled phone call to Buzz that described nothing. It was just the, there's been, I, I, I can't. It. <laughs> yes. Yep. Like every 911 call on cops. Yep. Right. No actual content, just something bad happened. Yeah. They, they get back to the, the safe house and Buzz is there. He's got some of his machinery as usual because he's a, he's a tech, technomancer. Hmm. He comes out, what, what happened? What's wrong? Is, is everything okay? And the, she goes up to him and she's just crying, crying in his arm. And I have a, uh, a thunderstorm audio playing, but it just started. So like the rain's just starting to fall. The wind's just starting to blow. They move the statue off the truck. Wait, what? What is that? Dave, what is that? We're sorry, Buzz. There wasn't anything we could do. They pull it off and they, and, and they drag it into the front yard and everybody sits around quiet, just mm. letting the rain fall and accepting the death of their partner. And they all go inside. And then they hear Buzz under his breath, no. No, I refuse. And keep in mind, Buzz is an NPC, so this is me giving the performance. Yeah. The scene that I described next is Buzz just getting all of his technology together, tearing wires out of the house, getting scrap parts from the junk cars around, attaching different like full nodes. MacGyver mode. Yeah, he's in full MacGyver mode. <laughs> yeah, and he's got this like fancy setup all around the statue, and he's he's screaming to the winds, "You give him back, damn you!" And he's it's such a cool statue, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> he, he pulls the lever. There's a big old flash of light. Lightning strikes the poles, and the statue is lit up just because there's that much power flowing through it. Everything dies down. The storm quiets for a moment, and the statue remains. Aww. And Buzz falls to his knees, at which point 
I start crying. <laughs> In and out of character. My own crap didn't work. <laughs> It, it wasn't supposed to, because uh, right. my, my uncle was going to, he was going to leave because he had some uh, stuff they needed to take care of. He wasn't going to join sessions anymore. Mm -hmm. So I, I couldn't let him, let it work, because I wasn't going to DM run his PC. Yeah, you don't NPC a, a, a character who has stayed with an adventure a while. That's not worth mm -hmm. it. It's, if it has to be done, it has to be done very tactfully yeah. and very temporarily and they step on a rusty nail and die <laughs> oh, <Yeah. laughs> that, i mean that's the opposite attack mind you yeah that is by far my favorite single game session my group cool. still talks about it three years later and we constantly work mm. to create a scene as or more emotional than that one so that I'm is what solidified I want my players to feel something. That's not, when you're in a session like that, or specifically that session, um, how much did the random element play? How many times did you have to roll dice to get to a point that was that exciting? Or was almost all of the excitement built up by the players and yourself? All right. So the randomness element, the dice rolling, the Jenga tower, yeah. all of that was done in the combat. Mm-hmm. That just, all right, I'm lining up a shot. I'm running to cover, and I'm going to be using it to block line of sight, yada, yada. I'm, I'm knocking the werewolf out in 1.2 seconds. All right, go for mm. it. Um, that's when all the rolling was done. After my uncle decided, you know what, I'm taking this backlash, boom, what happens? From there, that's when the rolling stopped. Nobody agreed to it. Nobody, excuse me, argued against it. It was just one of those natural things where this is important. We can't, we can't yeah. let this mess up. You can't trust it to the roll of a die. I get the, I, I get that. It's like um, you don't want somebody in the middle of that scene, maybe dragging the silver um, statue off the truck, and somebody say, "But well, we didn't roll strength, <laughs> right?" Right. It's like you don't, you don't need that in the middle. But I like mm -hmm. the idea that um, you were working within a system that set up the situation that called for everybody to take a step back and, and, and kind of say, all right, now it's all on us and Eli, because Eli is going to, going to um, try to revive a character that he knows he can't. And this is going to be a fun yeah. thing to watch and experience. So that, that's mm -hmm. the, the real kicker for that was that my uncle had told nobody, but me mm. the news that he wasn't going to be joining. It was completely secret. So everybody in the scene, out of character, kind of knew what Buzz was going for. Yeah. He was going to try to revive him because his whole shtick was uh, manipulating matter to, to whatever form it needs to be, and they didn't know the extent of his capabilities. So, oh, yeah, of course he's going to revive him. This yeah. is just this is the hero prevails archetype. Nope, this is the hero falls. Sorry. Yep, there you go. And then did he say, and I'm not coming back next week either. See you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> that, essentially, that was handled yeah. in a little after session, right. let's get back to reality talk. Yeah, that's neat. And, and I'm thinking about some of the things you've described so far. Um, and you mentioned 3.5 was your favorite overall system. What about within any specific system? Is there a rule or a way something is set up systematically? that you really like the way it works, like um, the feats or uh, dual wielding or some kind of combat system in a certain game or something like that. I, I just I like a pick and choose. What is your favorite part of some system? I think I would have to give it to the magic system in Mage the Ascension. Just and I've never played it, so describe so a little bit to me what makes it so special. So the World of Darkness, uh, White Wolf, Onyx Path stuff, it's on a D10 system okay. where you have dots for your attributes or skills. However many dots you have in whatever determines how many dice you're rolling. So if I have three dots in strength, which is a little above average, and then I have two dots in brawl, which is about your regular boxer at the gym, I roll five dice to determine how much damage I'm doing with my hit, if I hit. 
uh, the magic works the same way, but it's tied to your Arite stat. It goes from 0 to 10 if you want, like, we are gods. <laughs> the typical m max that a mage's Arite will get to in setting is about 5. But that's the point where you are not just warping reality, you are redefining it on a wow. whim okay. with just a thought. You don't need your special fancy Technomancer ray gun or spirit magic incense burning. It's just, I want this, so you do that. Uh, the higher your Arite, the more powerful stuff you can do. A normal mage is usually at about Arite 3. The magic itself is divided into nine spheres of influence, similar to schools of magic from D&D. Uh, most of what people would call evocation spells would be the forces sphere. It deals with natural forces, gravity, burning, sound, light, yada, yada. But then say conjuration, most of those could be held under the correspondence sphere, which is the correspondence <laughs> between two points, two ideas, uh, anything that could have a connection. It's, neat, yeah. it's very free form. Mm. And for the most part, the game tells you if you can rationalize it within your character, uh, it's gold. Yeah. So uh, I'm just, because I like to think of these scenarios, since I don't know the system, the way you just described it. If, I, um, if I'm at the entrance <clears throat> of a cavern and I see a torch down the wall there, if I can create a fire here and then put it out, I can use magic to put that torch out from here. It's out of my normal range or something like that because there's fire in both places. So there's a, that's one of the fun little nuances of the, uh, the correspondent sphere in specific. Mm -hmm. All of your magic is limited to your normal sensory ranges, sight, sound, smell, whatever. Mm -hmm. Correspondence lets you bypass that. So in this scenario, if you want to take your torch to put out somebody else's far away, you would still need correspondence as it's a separate entity far away, but you would also use forces as you were snuffing out the light, you're putting out the fire, you're blocking light from moving, whatever it is. That's kind of cool. I like that. So, yeah, I've always been a fan of magic that's magic, not magic that is uh, recipes. Uh, and, and, and I mean, I like both. Um, and I, I say recipes. Place. Yeah. And I say recipes like a fireball. You take this, you take this, it makes a ball, it goes boom, right? That's, and, and fireball does the same thing every time as long as you're cooking it right. Mm -hmm. And um, I do, I've always liked the idea of saying, you know, I, I am a flame wizard and I want to put, like to your one to ten, I want to put seven points of flame into this one. And what I want it to do is I want it to go swirl around that guy to set him on fire and then move over to, you know, make up the fire because you're mm -hmm. going to end up doing a d10 of damage or whatever it is anyway right yeah but that I, i've always liked the freedom that some systems give um with, with stuff like that that's pretty cool uh character you mentioned buzz which i i, I like that character already but <laughs> not just your own any character in a game that you've played or or mastered what is your favorite character and what is it about that character that made it so special to you? I feel like the cop-out answer is my first ever character. The, I, I usually <laughs> use that. Actually, when, when I uh, am asked these questions, I try and change it a little each time and reference a previous answer as well. <laughs> it's like, you know, <laughs> once I said this, but I really like this one too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's I, I mean, I, I, I did bring up Buzz. He is a very, very special boy for me because he is an NPC, but he is very much a character that I would want to play yeah. if I were ever in a mage game. But my favorite character that I've, I've seen, interacted with, played, whatever, I would honestly give it to my stepfather's rogue, Azarius. He's a very chaotic person. He is chaotic neutral in the right way. It's uh, not, I do whatever I want. He is whimsical. He yeah. is calculated and he is uncaring what yeah. you think. He does what he wants when he wants because it's 
the right thing to do or because it's the best thing to do. And I like the way you phrase that uncaring where a lot of people think chaotic means malicious and right. it, it's not, it, it's, you, you just didn't care. I, I, I didn't mean <laughs> to hurt you. It just didn't matter if you got hurt or not. Right. Yep. There but if I meant to play. hurt you, that's more like evil than it is um, just a chaotic neutral. And then like, I, I always like the idea of chaotic good is um, caring without consequences kind of thing too. Yep. Hey, I, I want you to get better, but if I have to punch you in the face to do it, then that's where we are, right? I am saving you. Do not yes. resist. Yes, I'm saving you from myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned you mentioned that character. The uh, what was it that that, or maybe it's a sequence of events. What maybe the growth of that character, that rogue? Um, I can't remember. Did you say Azarius? Yes. That rogue, like, um, let me just give me an example. Where did you start for levels? Where did you end up based on, you know, the system you were playing? How, how weak was the character to begin with? How strong? What, what made it your favorite character? Um, so what made Azarius my favorite is a, a one scene in particular where I had to interact with that, that PC. This was about halfway through the first iteration of my Arulane game. Uh, the party, excuse me, the party had... Funny, I burped at the same time. <laughs> uh, the party needed to contact the cleric's deity. Well, they were summoned by the cleric's deity okay. to talk about some nonsense that was going on, I think, in the church? No, in the mountains. It, it's It's been six years. Yeah. <laughs> um, on the way there, I decided to give them a fun little, just random encounter. They wa were walking down a hallway that split off to the left and the right, and they had to choose which way to go. The door on the end of both hallways was the exact same. So they talk about it for way longer than they're supposed to, and they decide, you know what, let's go left. All right, so you all turn left. What's everybody's wisdom score? What? <laughs> Why? Just tell me. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so I roll a, a perception for Zarius, the rogue. And he gets suspicious as they're walking down the hallway and turns around. And behind him, he sees a very familiar looking group of people. Wait a second. That's Quincent's ass. Quincent! <laughs> that is a cool name, Quincent. Yep, Quincent Stormhawk. That was the name of the cleric. That was like my that. uncle's character. So that, that was his in-character words, by the way. I yeah. said, you see a very looking familiar group of adventurers. Is it us? Yes. That's Quincent's ass. So they turn around, cool. and now everybody knows that there is another party there, that they, they're looking and talking to themselves. So I go to each of them in turn and have a conversation. The druid goes up to the other druid and says, hey, nice wolf. Yeah, right back at you. <laughs> and that's that. Uh -huh. <laughs> the uh, the cleric, his his character has a very strategic talk with himself, <laughs> just going over all the things they know, all the pieces they have, and how they all fit together. And they end up making new assumptions. I'm just repeating everything back to him, and he's yeah. like, "Wait a second, you're right." <laughs> That's good. I get to the rogue, and we just start talking nonsense. Mm -hmm. Talking about the weather, the day, who who this guy in front of me is, and it gets it gets pretty annoying. At which point, the cleric turns over. Hey, can you guys be quiet? And no joke, simultaneously, who me, you, <laughs> we, our nice it. It was the perfect DM moment. Yeah. I've always said that my step my stepfather and myself share the same brain cell. That was definitive proof. That was and the from then I have I've had a, a very deep love and respect for Isarius. He's just cool. it's so easy to get into his mindset. That's very good. Cool. So character. The help you um from that point and forward, I think you said that was like six years ago. Um were you able to tailor things for that character? I'm sure you do for all, but were you able to tailor things to that character that actually hit home better 
with your stepfather than maybe some of the others because you had such a, a, a bond with the character itself? I tried. Yeah. I tried so hard. <laughs> but like I said, he is chaotic neutral in mm -hmm. the best way possible. <laughs> I custom build an encounter for them that will take three sessions minimum, and they circumvent it in half an hour. Why? Yeah. Because I saw a shiny. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when he has never exhibited characteristics uh -huh. of kleptomania. I'm like, mm -hmm. you... But he plays it off so well. It's, it's established that his character is random, but has mm -hmm. a very set internal consistency. There are two layers to his character, and it's so hard to plan for one because the other will just mess it up. Yeah, that's cool. It, it, um, it makes me think of, uh, I think anybody who's ran a game is familiar with the old saying that regardless of what you plan, your players will mess it up, right? No <clears throat> and plan survives first contact. Exactly. And, and we're, we are familiar with that as people who run a game. But I think we also know the reality is that doesn't happen as often as people say it happens. It just happens a lot, right? And it we're um, in your mind. Yeah, exactly. Because when somebody actually plays the adventure A, B, C, D, E, that's the way it was supposed to go. So it, nothing really sticks out. But when they mm -hmm. start it and they go A, E, <laughs> it's like, yep. well, you, there was a lot of other stuff in there, guys. And it, it's um, we had a... Uh, an event it was gosh now three years ago maybe there's um uh, extra life charity is the name of it and and um they sponsor ch children's hospitals they um it was, it's i think it's in november anyway we did uh, as part of the podcast i did a full 24 hour thing which is essentially it, it's out there on youtube somewhere and i think i did the made the audio out there as well but it's three almost eight hour sessions because there was a slight break yes. in between them. Yes. And, and I was, I mean, literally on the air from midnight to past midnight the next day uh, because it was live on YouTube at the time as well as being recorded. Well, the reason I, I bring that up is one of the groups that I brought in, um, and this was in the shed itself, uh, I had set up an adventure for them, which if you say you're going to go on a one-shot adventure. We already know that there's a start and a finish. You've got to go save this thing, this person, whatever. And the first thing I put in your way is you need troll's blood. It just so happens that right up the river is a troll who's been burning cities and killing people. You go kill the troll and take his blood. No, yeah. no. These players went and bargained with the troll and traded tea and crumpets for a vial of troll's blood. Not a single drop was spilled on the player or the, the troll versus uh, due to combat. And it was like, what the hell are you guys? You kill things. What you do is kill things. I give you something obvious to kill. Okay, let's move on to the next step. <laughs> and that's just yeah. the way it works out. I, but we I still get to the next step, which is it's very useful, of course. Um, let, me let, let me ask you, do you have anything you want to ask me? Um. I guess, what is, what, what is your DMing style? I, I, I know best. I myself, right? Because <laughs> you haven't tried my meatloaf. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I personally go for more sandboxy type games and try to intervene as little as possible and let, let players have full control to the point where they'll even NPC for me. Yeah. My, my, the way I like to play it, and um, this has happened a lot through the years with the, the podcast and other games I've played. Um, I will set up a skeleton of what should be happening. I know what the world is. Uh, you mentioned you had that one um, continent that the, the world took over that name. And it's the same kind of idea. We'll have a world and I'll have some idea of where the hot spots and the cold spots are, both temperature wise and you know, political and, and treasure and what have you. But then that's about it. And then usually we'll start off with, give me your character's background. And between the character's background, I usually like to have three to four to five players at the table. One of them will name a place they came from that is interesting enough to me to start the adventure at. And then the best ideas that the players ever think I have should be one they came up with. <laughs> because that it's just going to be so much more memorable to them. Um, yeah. When, you know, when John the Rogue says, 
Uh, I came from a, a beat up little town outside of that major city. And, you know, there's one blacksmith in town and, and, and everybody's a farmer and all this. And then sometime later in the adventure, I say, well, we're going to your town. What was the blacksmith's name? And they'll look at me like, <laughs> how do you know there was a blacksmith? I'm like, well, because you said it two months ago and, and, and you grew up with the guy. So, uh, you know, his name and you know, the kind of wares he has around in, in his shop and, and what he could make for you and all this. And by the way, I, there's a lot of farmers in the area. Maybe you want to pick up some supplies while you're there. You knew there was farmers too. It's like, yeah, it was your idea, man. But, but yeah, one of my favorite things also is setting up a puzzle to which, yes, I have a solution, but once I've set up the puzzle, if one of them comes up with a better solution, that's the one that works. If I, you know, if I say there's just, um, we had a Christmas episode where we actually made these little gingerbread dungeon rooms, and mm -hmm. they're on the table. I think this one's up on, on YouTube. Um, and one of the rooms, in order to get out of the room, there was a door, and around the door was like a vine with a different colored light every foot or so Christmas lights around the door, but no okay. handle, no obvious handle or anything like that. Originally what I wanted to do was just have it. So at some point, if somebody touched the two red lights at the same time, the door would open. One of my players said, it's Christmas lights. You break one, they all go out. They <laughs> broke one, the door opened. <laughs> like, that because that was a so much better solution than what I came up with. I love it. It yeah. fits. It, yep. So like, all right, doors open. Move on. I understand so, that completely. So and and by you saying that, that I hope that, that should help describe some of the way I like to run a game. I love to tell you, like for example, if we're going to a place, um, and the sun is setting, and, and we know it's night. You know it's becoming nighttime. I'll I'll try and describe the look and feel and the textures. You know, instead of saying the sun is setting, I'll say you know the the leaves are are um, turning orange in front of you on the ground, and the sky is is darkening, and the the you're you're walking, uh, and the tree shadows are just falling farther and farther ahead of you as you're approaching this town. Instead of it's getting dark, guys. But then mm -hmm. I leave somebody else to say, oh, it's getting dark. Maybe we should camp. Uh, All right. That cool. kind of idea. I try, and, I try and lead to other people's ideas because four heads are better than one. Yeah. A lot, a lot of, yeah. <laughs> I, but I got a really shiny one in these lights. I got like a five and a half head or something. <laughs> yeah. I've got a tissue paper just covering my desk lamp. <laughs> To get I a smoother a, lighting. I, I got I, I can turn these down, but I didn't even think about it. I figured I'll just keep the same light the whole time. Yeah, I'll whatever works. I go. I, I, I'm an IT guy, so I know all this stuff already, but I never expected to use it to game. I mean I'm in my <laughs> office space where I was on four hours of conference calls today. And Oof. yeah, and now I'm just you know talking about gaming, which is so much better. I just unplug one computer, plug the other one in. Awesome. Um, in regards to uh, another question I had, mm -hmm. um, what it I don't want to sound like I'm just echoing your questions back at you because that's mm -hmm. not the purpose here. You're welcome to. <laughs> um, what is your experience with uh, tabletop RPGs? Well, way back in the old days when we <laughs> were using a rock and a chisel. Back when um, we still had Thacko Tuesdays. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was walking to my RPG games with snowshoes on, uphill, three ways. Oh, three. <laughs> oh, three. <laughs> well, it was more difficult back then. Um, right. Actually, I started in sixth grade. The first time we even talked about playing a game, I, the, the, you know, everyone has that picture in their mind of where it started. And for me, it was we were – playing out the, on the sled in the playground. It was one of these steel sleds. And uh, when we went out to, to slide, it was too hot. So we went underneath mm -hmm. it where the shade was. And we started talking about this cool game that one of the guys had gotten. And um, it was uh, this Dungeons and Dragons thing. And I, I started back then um, with the, I, I played a fighter because that's what the class was. Uh, and the fighter, I think, was only human. I don't think you could pick something else. A dwarf was actually a class. An elf was a class. Yeah, yeah. And um, I did, uh, I'd say, a year or so 
of playing along. And then when we changed schools, that's when I said, you know, I want to keep playing, but nobody else wants to do what this guy was doing. So now I'm going to do that. And that's when I started um, DM. And from there, well, it's just been the full gamut. Um, I've really enjoyed doing the podcasting. That's been four years uh, at a local gaming shop, which is unfortunately since closed. I ran uh, some of the Pathfinder adventures, uh, the D and D encounters. I think it was encounters, but that was where you just get people into the game store and you run a session that Wizards of the Coast put out there specifically for you to run for new players to try and get them into the game. And that was pretty fun. It's actually where I met a few of the people that were previously on the podcast. And, um, you know, from there, just playing at different people's houses over the years. I originally lived in Massachusetts, moved to South Carolina 15 years ago, 14 years ago. 14. I'm going to say 14. So it was 2007. It's 2020. That's a little more like 13, isn't it? I don't math. I really don't. It's horrible. Um, but I've played Dungeons and Dragons is, and Medieval Fantasy is the most often game I've played because of the popularity. There's another game that uh, won some uh, awards a few years ago called Dungeon World, which is very much story based. And I would say probably almost half of the uh, the years of Adventures from the Shed is probably played in the Dungeon World system. Uh, I've also played on the podcast. We've also played the Pathfinder starter box. We started the podcast with the D and D starter box, which uh, I'll say again is probably the single best one item purchase anybody could get in regards to Dungeons and Dragons, especially if you like Fifth Edition. Um, mm-hmm. You get a, a set of dice. And you get an adventure and all the rules you need for five people to play for $15. It's just outstanding. Plus, they wrote a lot of the adventure open so that you can almost sandbox it even as a beginning DM. Very cool. Uh, we played some of the Star Wars, um, the, the extra dice system crap. I can't remember what the name of it is. But we played Age of Rebellion and Edge of the Empire, I think. And... Um, they just use dice pools, a bunch of different dice with symbols on them, and you have to roll a whole bunch at once, which is a really neat system. doesn't necessarily play great with an audio podcast, but it, yeah. it's a cool system. Uh, we beta tested a couple. There was one called uh, Idara, Adara something, the, the E-D-A-R-A. Um, that's the name of it, but it had more to it. There was like a pref a pre- before that, words before it. Damn it. Now I can't remember. It was a steampunk uh, D12 system, which was interesting. Uh, We had another system that um, I want to say it was kickstarted and they reached out to us to play. It was called Tavern Tales. And that game was kind of an interesting one in that it used 2D20 for almost everything. And pretty much the way it worked was uh, if what you needed was between the two dice, you got it. So, like, if you needed a 12, and, and you, well, it was a range. Uh, if you needed this range and you rolled one die lower and one die higher, you could get the thing, which was, it was an, an odd system to work with, but it actually worked quickly because there wasn't a whole lot of different dice to grab. But that was also medieval fantasy. Uh, Star Trek um, is currently, Star Trek, is it Frontiers? Uh, Modifius Games, they're the ones that did it. They had a, an alpha test a while ago. It's, it's a full-blown production. It's out there now, and you can, you can buy the game. But that Star Trek Adventures, that's what it is. Star Trek Adventures. It takes place in the next generation time, fe- uh, time frame, which is the one I like. And um, we played several, I want to say we probably played five hours around that. And that was probably the only one where I ever, ever ripped anything off. At the beginning of those episodes, I took the uh, Star Trek Next Generation sound, the, the music, and mm. that's the intro <laughs> for those episodes. And I do a little podcast log. Um, and it was, it was a fun thing to do. Um, All see. right. Cool. I've never played a vampire-themed game. And, um, oh, I played Marvel superheroes a long time ago, too. And then what was the other? There's another hero, superheroes one. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, Something in Villains? 
You were, uh, I don't know. Something. It doesn't ring a bell to me. The uh, closest I can think is the Street Fighter tabletop game from White Wolf. Yeah, I've never played that. Neither have I. I've heard some interesting <laughs> things about it. Um, that, that's cool. That's a very wide range. Definitely much more than, than I've been exposed to because I haven't really experimented in like steampunk or sci-fi games or, mm. well, I mean, I have played Fallout, so I can't say post the fuck. Regardless. <laughs> yeah. Um, another question I did have, I'm not very familiar with podcasts. The format, I understand that the premise is essentially like an audio book with yeah. just people instead yep. of just a narrator. Um, is there any advice that you would have for somebody who's not used to partaking in this format? Well, I can say specifically for you, um, you, you've done good here. You, you talk, you fill in the gaps, you say things that you think are interesting. Um, oh, by the way, I also thought they were interesting, but it's important that you think what you're saying <laughs> is interesting and, and, and possibly useful. But the, the big thing about it is what the, the reason I even started it was it would be, I guess I'd be going back maybe 10 years or so when I found my first D&D audio podcast. And it was one of those things where I was like, hey, the job I had at the time, I could sit at my desk and listen to that while I'm typing away at this, waiting for that process to run. You know, being an IT guy, for me, at least half of the time, I'm waiting for something to happen while I'm watching it. And so I can listen to stuff. I I'd originally listened to some audio books, but then I found some some of these podcasts and I wasn't playing any role playing game at the time. And it was cool to listen to other people go through experiences. I had great for ideas, great for humor. You know, every now and then you just find yourself laughing at your desk and no one else can hear what's going on. That's always fun. Uh, and then I said to myself, the one thing that I'm missing on these different podcasts I've listened to isn't talent. It isn't story content. It's audibility. Almost everybody would have, like one microphone in the middle of a room and you'd hear the loud people, but you didn't hear the quiet people. And I, and I kept telling myself, you know what? I want to make my own quality audio podcast because then I'm going to enjoy playing a game and I'm going to fulfill a need that whether anyone else sees it, I do. <laughs> and, and so okay. I decided, you know, that's what I'm going to do. And then, uh, just about every episode that was recorded in the shed, each person has their microphone. They have a head-worn wireless microphone. Um, I record each person on a separate channel. So if later on I hear that one person wasn't loud enough, I just boost that audio up before I export it you know, for, to uh, iTunes or wherever it's going. And that was the important piece to me. But the, the driver really is to play games and try and be entertaining enough that other people can enjoy listening to us play a game. So if you've ever thought, uh, especially running a game, if you ever told somebody, a, a friend or an acquaintance or somebody, just come along and check it out. You know, it, it, you might like it. it. It's that kind of idea that, that we're inviting anybody out there to come along and check out this game that we're playing. And maybe they'll like it. And if so, they'll listen to the next episode and the next one and the next one. And I've never... Um, monetized anything. I don't know if I ever will, but it's all been just out of my pocket stuff. You know, I pay monthly for the hosting and all this stuff, but it's all about keeping a hobby going and just trying to have a lot of fun with it. If someday I reach, you know, thousands instead of hundreds of people listening uh, all the time, then maybe uh, I'll try to make money off it. But in the meantime, I don't need to make five cents a month and annoy people with ads. Yeah. I, I can understand that. That's yeah. that's good advice. I, now, I other understand. ones like Critical Role and others where they've probably got, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know how many subscribers they've got. Maybe fifty thousand or so. Um, my head. Where, where you can probably make enough money to at least pay for the service you're using to host the stuff. Sure. And <laughs> I know they have producers and everything too. Hey, if you ever go look at all of the stuff that's up there on Adventures from the Shed, all the, the video stuff with different cameras and all that, that's me live. I'm doing all this stuff as we're going, <laughs> adjusting this, moving that. Uh, there's no, no assistants, no producers, no sound people, no video people. So it's all, we call it low budget because it's a, it's a negative number <laughs> at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're not making money off of it, then by, by nature you're in the red. 
Yep. That's not necessarily a bad thing. No, if, it's been, especially it's if it's been more fun. like a passion project. And I want to keep going with it, which is why we're here today. Well, I can't think of any uh, really relevant questions. Um, no, we'll have plenty uh, of time for other questions afterwards, too. <clears throat> um, I, I actually do have a question. Throughout this uh, recording, I've been cracking my knuckles, uh, popping my elbow. Have you been able to hear any of that? I don't think so. What, it'll really come out when I listen to it separately on um, speakers. I have some decent quality, you know, triple driver headphones. That Right now I'm making sure I can hear everything while we're going. But, um, you know, on the same note, I don't think much of this sound has come through. Um, I, I think it's been good. Uh, and when I listen back to it, we'll find out. And I wanted, by the way, it's a great question because I want to check that with each person I talk to. That was one reason in the post I made, I, I did emphasize that we want quality gear. I don't want anybody to go out and spend $100 on a microphone, but I also want to make sure people at least have some form of headphones and a microphone that they can put where they need and adjust how they need. So a head-worn set or, or whatever works fine. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I actually did just get this a couple of days ago. Yeah. I figured I might finally get an upgrade from the little $12 Walmart <laughs> there you go. headset. Um, this is the, oh, what's the box? Uh, Corsair Void Elite. Nice cool. 50 bucks, but the audio has been great, and I haven't heard any complaints about my sound. Yeah, the so. sound is just fine. Like I was saying at the beginning, the sound is internet audio sound. There's nothing All wrong right. with it. Dope. Uh, the only thing that I am going to upgrade at any point is this piece of crap right here. Not, <laughs> you not just you. pointed at me. <laughs> not you. The. I'll take an upgrade. Uh, <laughs> no problem. Look, if I could afford it, <laughs> I'd get uh, it to myself first. But yeah, I, well, <laughs> I, I do want I to upgrade you. this webcam. You can see yep. me, but... I mean, you saw my hand there for two frames. I just yeah. lifted it up and set it down. It, I, yeah. I know this is supposed to be audio primary, yeah. but well, I want the video to be decent. Yeah, right. That like if if I'm going to be on video, I want it to look nice. Yeah, and I so. have, and I'll keep this in the recording too because uh, I, I like the quality. But it's the Logitech C930. I think it may even be C930e. But it, the Logitech C900 series is a 1080 webcam. It's got a nice wide angle, and um, I definitely suggest it to people. It even has a decent microphone, but, um, I mean, I have a good microphone, so I don't need to settle for decent. C930. C930. And like I said, I think it might be the E, but without opening my system preferences and everything right now, I can't see that. Mm -hmm. But... Um, if you, you'll go, you'll probably see a C920, which was a previous one. There's a C900 series that says streaming on it. It's part of the name, and it's designed for streamers and what have you. But um, it's definitely a worthwhile investment because depending on where you find it and how much demand it's in, it's anywhere between like 70 and 100 bucks. It's not horrible, um, but it's, uh, it, it's a good quality, just straight up USB webcam, easy to work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at this point, pretty much anything's going to be better than something that I'm pretty sure is from 2005. That's yeah, any upgrade might be a little bit better. <laughs> um, I actually do remember talking about this piece of crap here. Um, how I use swearing a lot to express myself in my personal <laughs> life, and I know that that's something that not a yeah. lot of people are cool with, so... I know I can work with it. I feel like I've done a fairly decent job of working with it here. Yep. Um, yep. What is what is your personal sense? Because this is your show. Okay, I'm, so I don't want to step on your toes. No problem. We've had so I, I think a lot of it will will depend on the audience. Let me give you a little little example. From the beginning, I've always said it doesn't matter the words, but more so the situation. Right. So it depends on if we're saying something that's offensive, not words that are offensive. Right, so there are things we steer away from typically, um, and I don't want to talk about them because those are things we steer away from. I would say those off the record, but um, okay. when it comes to the podcast, every episode, with the exception of uh, the Pathfinder starter set, which 
one of the the podcast members, Kurt, he ran that, and he wanted to be able to run it so he, his kids could listen to it. Every except for those, every single podcast that I've released starts with the following podcast may be explicit, just like that. Now. Those several episodes of the Pathfinder starter set, I, I actually changed it to the following podcast is not explicit. <laughs> so when it comes right down to it, it's all about the situation. If, if we're in the middle of playing and um, a role comes up and it's completely flubbed, oh, fuck, that's okay. No problem. Those are words. It's not a situation that should bother anybody. And, and that's really what it comes down to for me. The words okay. are just words. Words don't, I don't think words hurt. It's how they're used that matters. Awesome. It is nice to see somebody else of that mindset. That, I mean, and that's how I'll tell everybody. Um, it, it, most of the time, if the character is angry or if a player is frustrated, I expect something explicit or at least funny. You know, some, some, oh, fluffer nutters or something, right? And you could make a shtick for a character based on a, a, a bad a swear word or something. That That's all fine. All fun and games. All right. Not going to lie. I was kind of hoping that you would say that, no, you have to sense yourself. So then every time I say a swear, I have to just shout, beep. <laughs> and you know, you then. can do that. that. I mean, it's a, it's a ah, great way to beep. develop a shtick. Just at yeah. the same volume. <laughs> yeah. Every time. Cool. Uh, well, um, I don't have any other questions for you this time, Eli. If you have any others, I do not feel them. Great. Um, so with that, we're going to wrap this one up. And um, I know we'll be in touch again. Uh, I have somebody to talk to tomorrow. I have a returning member of the podcast who is going to be joining us. Nice. And um, I am hoping that within a week, we'll be able to pick the first day where we can all get together and talk kind of a zero day session to set some expectations as a group and to meet and greet all right all right that sounds good to me cool thank you so much for your time yeah and thank you thank you definitely for joining me and uh we'll catch up very soon thanks bye the preceding podcast was brought to you by one joe young you can find us online at adventuresfromtheshed.com